With me today is Tony Lloyd. Tony is a former Fortune 500 company executive with companies such as John Deere, Medtronic and Buffalo Wild Wings. Tony is a best-selling author, keynote speaker, business coach and fellow podcast host. Welcome, Tony, and thanks for joining me today. Uh, thanks for having me, Christy. Oh, I think that was my computer telling me it's time to start. <laughs> so, uh -huh. We're start. Yeah. Okay, so Tony, this podcast is all about um, people and following their journeys through life, yeah. and because we all know that you know where we are now is not where we started, and you've been on quite a journey. So, could you tell me how it all began? Could you take us back to the start of your career? Uh, yeah, I, I think I think an important point before my career started because I, I actually I've always been working right. So from the time I was a child all the way up until today, I've always had some sort of job, and uh, so everything from picking berries to you know vice president of company. So, um, but but I you know one thing that I think kind of informs everything I do was when I was about fourteen years old, I had a near drowning accident, and I think. What that does for one and for me is it kind of it it sends off this sort of reality alarm that it, it's not just you know hey someday we're all going to die it's like holy cats we're really going to die right you know? <laughs> and so and so uh, you know from the time I was fourteen years old until today I've always thought. I want to live a life of purpose and meaning. I, I want this short, amazing life to mean something, to do something in the in it. So, um, you know, I I um, uh, I had a technical consulting career where I worked with you know large organizations doing very technical work, sort of an engineering role, um, and that led into a uh, training other people how to do the kind of work that I did, which led to train the trainer, which led me to learning more about how do people learn and, and retain information for a longer period of time, um, which sort of led to an evolution where I said, you know, training is one tool in the tool belt. And what happens in, in corporations is sometimes, um, you know, someone will come to the training department and they'll say, we have a training problem. Can you help me with that? And that's like going to your doctor and saying, I have an aspirin problem. And, and so training is just, it's just one tool. And so what's the real goal behind that? The real goal is human performance improvement. And so I, I learned how to help organizations transition from learning organizations to human performance improvement organizations, looking at the whole swath of possibilities of what could improve human performance. So I was doing that kind of work um, when I was recruited in by John Deere. So you mentioned John Deere at the offset. You know, a lot of people know them globally. They make agricultural equipment, construction equipment, mining equipment. Uh, they, they sell OEM parts into lots of manufacturers. They have consumer equipment. So um, they recruited me in and just gave me a very broad swath. It's like in the interview, um, I was speaking to one of the, um, well, I was speaking to the president of the company and he said, you know, what can you do, right? And so I had built sort of this, this table in my head that said, well, you know, your job description says this and I have this experience and your job description says that and I have this experience. And he just stopped me like mid-sentence and he said, I didn't ask you what my job description said. I just want to know what could you do? And so that's, well, that's a completely different question, isn't yeah. it? So we brainstormed some great ideas. And um, eventually within John Deere, I did an entrepreneurial startup. And this was about 1998, 99, something like that. And the dot-com bubble was just starting to percolate a little bit. So we did a, a sort of an e startup within John Deere where we took our corporate university and we brought it online. Um, we did a lot of assessments online. We brought training material online. And this was, you know, ancient of days. We were carving it all in stone tablets and putting up, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I really, you know, led a team, a global team, and that grew my career. You know, I went from manager there to, you know, the next role I had was the global head of learning and development for a spinoff company from SE Johnson. Uh, we sold that company about three years later. 
that freed me up. I went up to Medtronic here in, uh, I'm in the Minneapolis, St. Paul Metroplex in uh, Minnesota here in the middle of the United States. And uh, so I was here with Medtronic and then uh, eventually I ended my career at B Buffalo Wild Wings. I was a vice president of organization and team effectiveness. Um, and then about 2014, I just sort of said, okay, I'm kind of done with that uh, corporate life and it's time for me to go do something else. So, you know, today, as you mentioned, I'm an author, I'm a speaker, I'm a coach, I'm a podcaster. So I do a lot of work. I kind of live a portfolio life, if you will. So I do a lot of little things or a lot of big things sometimes. Um, but that, that's kind of my story. That's how I got here today. So do you think that experience, first off with John Deere, set you on a trajectory of, I suppose, being at the forefront of the things that you've done? Because obviously entrepreneurship and, you know, even having an interview that takes it away from the traditional, you know, tell me about yourself, let's read through your CV, let's do those things. So do you right. think that meeting somebody that was, you know, so far, I suppose, ahead of their times really set you on that path of being able to, develop learning and development programs that were going to help people much further into the future than, than the current day. Right. Um, I, I think that uh, John Deere, um, as you might say, is innovative, right? I might say innovative, but innovative, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so they are innovative. It is very interesting because we think of them as like this traditional agricultural company, and yet they're very cutting edge. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, all the way from the beginning when John Deere, the person made a plow, he took stainless steel and he hammered it into, uh, or he took, I think, a saw blade and he hammered it into a, a, a plow and it shed the sticky soil away from it. And it was an innovation. So he, the whole company was built on innovation and continues to innovate today. So I think that they were a little bit cutting edge. They were willing to experiment. They were a little bit, um, I, whatever the opposite of risk averse is, right? So they, they were willing to take a risk, uh, but they, they also knew how to control the experiment. Right. So let's not let's not bet the company on this. But, mm -hmm. you know, this is an idea. Let's make a small investment and let's see what happens to it. So, yeah, they they were willing to take a risk and it really set my career from that point forward. Uh, but, you know, I've always been a lifelong learner. Right. I've had to reinvent myself many, many times throughout my career. So I think my ability also to pivot, to be able to say, that's not working. What will will work? Let's just pivot somewhere nearby and go off on that other thing. I think that's helped me a long way too. Yes, yeah, so I definitely want to talk about pivoting and persistence um, a little bit <laughs> down the track. But I wanted to ask you, obviously, you know, you've worked for John Deere, Medtronic, Buffalo Wild Wings. They're all in vastly different sectors. Yes. So do you think that industries, you know, in and of itself are, just the same as a core business? Or do you think it's really, really hard to go into different sort of industries and to be able to pick up what you need to? Right. I think it depends on how you think about yourself and your niche, right, or your niche. Uh, so it, it just depends on that, right? So for me, every organization, you have leadership, you have products, you have marketing, you have finance. Those things transfer across all industries. And if you learn leadership, if you learn how to you know, lead self, lead others, to communicate, to influence, that will go across any organization. And sometimes you know, I, I work with startups and sometimes I'm with them in pitch competitions and I often look at them and I go, okay, I, I don't know that I agree with this company philosophy. I don't know that I, they're on the right product, but you know what, I'm gonna bet on this team. I bet this team is gonna figure this out. And so, it just depends on how you think about yourself. If you think about yourself as, you know, a product specialist within an organization, well, yeah, the farther down that rabbit hole you go, the more you're going to say, well, that's not really a great transferable skill. Um, and yet, if you're an engineer, you can be an engineer almost anywhere, whether you're a mechanical engineer, a fluids engineer, a, you know, an electrical engineer, whatever that might be. So, you know, um, I, I like that Jeff Goins idea about a portfolio life that we we just sort of pick things that are interesting to us and we work on those. So, yeah, I, I would just say that you can transfer across completely different industries as long as you think of yourself in a way 
that these skills are transferable. So as a coach, how do you speak to people, that the, the people that you're working with, to be able to market themselves as somebody with those transferable skills? Yeah. You know, um, I think that the first thing that one has to do is clarify their vision, right? So like, who do you serve? And maybe what you serve is, you know, this particular niche within this particular niche and you're, you know, you're way down in the weeds here. But if you back up a little bit, you know, um, when you think about, let's just say that your specialty is in the airline industry. Well, are you in the airline industry or are you in transportation? And are, you know, are the things that you're talking about and using there, are they transferable? So the first thing to ask yourself is, who do I serve? Second thing is, what is their problem? Right. And because you're going to find common problems across every organization. If you if you're working with a sales organization uh, that is a B2B sales organization over here and they're going to be trying to figure out how to attract customers, they're going to be hey, hey, um, trying to figure out how to get those, uh, you know, those uh, face to face sessions. They're going to be trying to figure out how to convert those potential customers into paying customers. They're going to think about how to grow those customers. So that set of skills and B2B company A is going to work in B2B company B. That's that's a lot of Bs in there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, but but it also some of those same skills can work in business to consumers. So so um, who do you serve? What is their problem? How do you solve the problem? What is your unique selling proposition? What is the thing that you bring? So think about what are my unique skills and competencies? What motivates me? What are my values? You know what what do I bring to the table? And then think about What's the larger impact that you want to have? Because if you, you know, if, if what you're all about, if your big why, if the thing that motivates you is about clean water or it's about hunger or it's about, you know, education or whatever that thing might be, when you can link what you're doing to your greater purpose, <laughs> forget about it. <laughs> you are just going to make some progress. So I wanted to talk about finding your why because, you know, there's people like Simon Sinek who, you know, their, their whole focus, I suppose, is around find your why. Yeah. But how does someone find their purpose? How do they find their why? And do you think it always has to be the first thing? Do you think that you have to know your why and then progress? Or do you think that your why can come along partway through, you, through your progress? Right, right. Hey, Christy, that's a great question. So let's just start with your why. I, I find that if I ask someone, what breaks your heart? And they're, and they're sort of a self-aware person and they spend some time reflecting. They're going to figure out, here's something in the world that really breaks my heart. Or if they really can't get there, then sometimes I ask people, what inspires you? Who do you see that's a business model or a, or a person in the world that inspires you that you'd like to be like? And so whether you're sort of moving away from or moving toward, either way, you can get to here's the thing that just lights my fire. And you're right about one thing. It, it is evolving. You know, in uh, probably 2012, I was all about malaria. I was like, you know, can we just figure out a way to wipe out a malaria and like 5,000 kids a day are dying from this and it's just a preventable disease and it's just we have the answers in hand. Can we not go do that? A year later, I was all about climate change. I was just like, if we don't solve that, it doesn't matter if we solve malaria, right? So uh, where I land today is um, I talk to social entrepreneurs and I work at the level of the individual and the business. And so whether they are creating a business that does social good through what they sell or how they source or you know what they share or how they staff or whatever all these things are common across all organizations and whether their you know their why is about you know like i said uh, hunger or clean water or education or anything if you take any of the 17 sustainable development goals you know i can work with people who are trying to achieve those so my why has become sort of facilitating the growth of these purpose-driven business leaders. That's really what I'm all about. And it doesn't have to look a certain way. So your, your why does evolve over time as you learn more. I think you're sort of reading my mind here, Tony, because my next question was going to be, obviously, you're on a mission to help 
others be purpose driven. So I was going to say, is that your purpose? Is that your calling to be able to do that? Yeah, you know, um, so I don't, I don't talk about this a lot. So here's an exclusive, just for you, Christy. You, you're gonna get this. <laughs> get it, get it here first. All right, you get it here first. So um, at one point in my life, you know, I told you when I was 14 years old, I just, I knew that I wanted my life to have purpose and meaning, and so, you know, at hand, what I had available to me was really about religion. It was about Christianity. And I thought, you know, that's it. what higher, you know, higher calling in the world could there be than God, right? You know, that that's it. I've reached the pinnacle right here. Um, and so I got involved in churches and I was very involved. I, you know, at one point I was even the pastor of a church. Now, you know, I have a friend of mine who says to me, I hope it doesn't offend you if I say that, but I just can't picture that for you. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, so, but. Um, eventually, uh, in uh, 1991, I was divorced. And in the particular denomination I was in, they didn't believe in remarriage. And so I was sort of like, you know, per persona non grata. It was like, uh, you know, we don't really know what to do with you. Now, your wife can stay because she's a perfectly lovely person, but you should go away. And so it, what it did for me was it gave me kind of a control alt delete. It gave me that sort of reset to say, why do you believe what you believe and what are you all about? So off I go on my merry way and I start exploring Buddhism and I explore, you know, uh, Tai Chi. I explore all kinds of things. Um, and in 1996, so this is like five years later, I'm in a workshop and I go through a writing exercise with this person. And it's a personal growth, sort of personal transformation workshop. And I go through this writing exercise and the person says, okay, at the top of the page, I want you to start writing um, the story of me, right? It, this is the story of me and you can start wherever you want and you can leave off whatever you want and bring in whatever you want and whatever, but you only have three minutes. So in the next three minutes, write the story of me. So write as hard and as fast as you can. So I did that. And then she stops the timer and she said, okay, at the top of the page, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to just pull the values out of that story. So here's the values that showed up in my life in the story. And remember, you brought in the characters you did. You brought in the parts of the story that you did. So this is your story. So at the top of the page, she's like, try to stretch. Get 10 values if you can in the next couple of minutes. So I'm writing these values at the top of the page. All right. Then she says, okay, fresh, clean piece of paper. At the top of the page, I want you to write uh, what's important to me is and just start taking those value words and dropping them in here. We're going to give you a couple of minutes to write this. So I start, you know, writing in what's important to me is, and I'm dropping in all these value phrases that I'd gotten out of my story. And then she's like, okay, we're going to rewrite this and we're going to just bring it down to just one paragraph. You know, if you feel like you're about to a paragraph break, let's just stop there. So tighten it up. So we tighten it up. She's like, okay, bring it into one sentence. What's important to me is blah. Right. So I start writing, you know, what's important to me is this and that and that and that and that. Right. So I'm making this long uh, sentence. And then she says, OK. One sentence, what's important to me is and take all the stuff you've written in that sentence. You don't get any conjunctions. You can't say and you can't say or or but or still or therefore or anything else. Just, you know, what's important to me is one tight sentence. So I write that. And then she says, all right, take your pen and where it says what's important to me is and strike that out. And at the top of the page, I want you to write the purpose of my life is. And so my sentence said the purpose of my life is to facilitate spiritual growth. Wow. I cried for five minutes mm. because I suddenly realized it doesn't have to look a certain way that when one grows in their personal life, in their physical life, in their mental life, in their spiritual life, it, it doesn't have to look, the, your growth doesn't have to look the same as my growth. And that word, that spiritual word, it still freaks me out when it comes out of my mouth. mouth. I, I'm very uncomfortable, even today as we're recording this, I'm uncomfortable saying that sentence, but I know it to be true for me. That that's my thing. That if you know the people that I work with, 
I had I had one person, um, a, a guy named Mike. He was from uh, New Zealand. He was in one of my workshops, and at the end of the workshop, he said, "You know, um, it was a leadership development workshop." And at the end of the workshop, he said, "You know, am I am I going to be a better employee? You bet I am. My boss is going to thank you for sending me to this training." He said, "And am I going to be a better boss? Well, sure. So my employees are going to thank you." for helping me through this workshop. And he just, you know, he's big Mike, we call it, big, huge guy. And he just sort of like teared up a little and he's just standing there and sort of, you know, like caught his breath a little bit. And then finally he goes, you know who's gonna thank you the most? My wife is gonna thank you the most because I'm a better human being because I've been here this week. And, and to see that kind of transformation, like I am all about that. I would run through a wall to see that happen for somebody. So that was probably a 10,000 word answer to your three word uh, question. But but that's me. That's who I am. That's what I'm all about. But I think that's amazing because obviously that's a really hard thing to be able to do. It's a hard thing to succinctly put forward what your purpose is and to yeah. be able to break it down in the way that she did with you, yeah. you know, it's quite confronting to be able to do that as well. Yes. You, do you find that you do that with other people now to be able to help them do that? Because that, that seems like a really good strategy to be able to get that answer. Yeah. I, I think that um, I, I don't use that particular exercise. I haven't anyway, but the best leaders know themselves the best. Mm -hmm. And so anything you can do to help them to reflect, um, and whether that's just through a reflection es exercise or a self-assessment, but with business leaders, I often find, you know, depending on the size of the company, right? If it's a startup, this doesn't necessarily work, but a larger organization, it works a 360 degree feedback um, it really works, and especially if you anchor that 360-degree feedback in emotional intelligence. If you can say we're going to, you know, we're going to get people to give you feedback, and they're going to give you feedback on your leadership style and all these other things, but they're going to give you feedback about these sort of four quadrants of the uh, emotional intelligence. That is very revealing. <laughs> And it's humbling. You know, we, uh, uh, there's a common phrase in uh, leadership development where we talk about how people respond to really strong feedback like that. And uh, it's called SARA, S-A-R-A. -A. So that's surprise, then anger. Then um, you begin to, you know, sort of, um, I forgot what the R is, but you're, you're beginning to negotiate that, Just right? Realize, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're beginning to negotiate around that, and finally you accept it, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's that's not an uncommon reaction to getting feedback. Um, so it's been too long since I talked about Sarah, I guess. Uh, but the um, whatever you can do to bring in feedback to yourself. In fact, a few years ago, I wrote an article like, if you are a independent contractor, how do you get 360 degree feedback? And so I, I have a whole methodology around that about how you reach out to clients and just consider them to be your boss, and then you know uh, peer organizations and you know people who work with you as contractors or whatever. Um, but it, still, when you get that kind of feedback, if you let it sink in, right, if you just sit with it and live with it and just accept it, then, you know, oh, rationalization, that's what the R was. Sometimes we try to rationalize. All right. So that that's the answer to that question, I guess. So I want to sort of, we're talking about, you know, higher purpose and um, becoming better people and things like that. I want to preface my next comment um, and question to say that, you know, media outlets constantly sort of report that, you know, if you come to Australia, you're going to get attacked by, you know, deadly species and you can't really go anywhere and, you, you know, <laughs> everything's going to get you, um, which couldn't be further from the truth, you know. You so, seem perfectly nice. <laughs> exactly. So I 100% understand sort of fake news and things being sort of blown out of proportion. Okay. okay. But without getting sort of too political, you live in Minneapolis, yep. which is the heart of the George uh, Floyd protests and riots. Right. And this obviously made sort of worldwide news and the issues 
around that are, are really, really complex. Right. And I also read that Minneapolis is one of the most dangerous cities in the United States, which I was really quite interested about. Yeah. But do you think that's true? And if so, or even if it's not true, how yeah. important is it for businesses and individuals in these regions to become more purpose-driven, to look within themselves and to look externally to become better global citizens? Right. Okay. Well, <laughs> excuse me. So you've opened this up. This is good. Uh, so first, I will say that it is not true that Minneapolis is one of the most da dangerous cities in the world. That you know, again, fake news, right? Um, and I'm glad that you framed it that way. Um, but I will say that when it comes to racial disparity, when it comes to the lived experience of people of color, so Black Indigenous people of color, whether they're you know Hispanic or whatever. Um, so the, the, their lived experience and the lived experience of white people in Minnesota is stark. There is a large gap. And one of the reasons for that is because there is this very high quality of life for white people. And so it just amplifies that gap in between. Um, so uh, it is critically important that because we know that there is this massive gap in the lived experience of uh, black indigenous people of color and white people, it is incredibly important that we pay attention to it. And what I did was, um, you know, I'm a, I, I'm a podcaster like you. And so when um, George Floyd was murdered, I, I had always been aware of this racial disparity. And I had been, um, you know, being very conscious about talking about that and interviewing people about that. And then I even m made a, uh, a conscious effort that um, in my podcast, I say, we, we interview um, uh, underrepresented voices, right? So underrepresented voices focused on solutions. So I already was aware of that. I was already making an effort, but it wasn't enough. And so with the murder of George Floyd, I was popping off something on Facebook about how upsetting it was or something. And a, a friend of mine, now I'm, I'm 62 years old. And so a friend of mine from high school, somebody I've not seen since high school, who happened to be linked to me on Facebook, I popped off about it. And she's like, okay, big boy, you have a platform. What are you going to do about it? Wow. Like, oh, man. <laughs> I was not ready for that. So, so I did, um, it, leading up to the 2020 election, I launched a podcast called Anti-Racist Voter. And it's really about how do we use our vote to, um, to dismantle systemic racism? Because it is not enough to not be racist. It is important that we use whatever means we have available to us to be anti -racist racist, to dismantle systemic racism where we can. So, um, so I did that. Now, I, here's, here's what I learned from that experiment, because I, I just did it from, you know, um, midsummer into November for our U.S. elections. I learned that I don't have standing in that community. I learned that I have not done enough. Um, I, I knew that it was not the job of uh, black, indigenous, and people of color to educate me. It was my job to educate myself. And yet, when I would reach out to someone and I would say, you know, I'd love to interview for this uh, program, they would go, and who are you? And what are your credentials? And where did you come from? And how come you're showing up right now? And it's like, okay, you know, so I had to overcome that. And I'm still overcoming it, right? But I do think that... Um, every organization, you know, I mean, you know, just if I'm a large organization, let's just start with our, um, you know, our diversity and equality and our, um, you know, how we, how we show up within our organization, right? So let's just start with that. What are the opportunities for, uh, for people of color within our organizations? But that's just the beginning, right? So how do we go about finding suppliers that are underrepresented? How do we go about selling to people that we did not normally uh, find ways to 
uh, to reach? How do we go about, you know, sourcing or staffing or whatever in ways that dismantle systemic racism? Or even just how do we share as an organization? What what charities are we giving to? And are we doing enough right now? And that is a hard question that every organization has to ask themselves. Yeah, great answer. And, you know, I think it's inevitable that change requires money. So, you know, there's a lot more I think that businesses can do. I don't necessarily think that they have to have lived those experiences, but they need to be able to acknowledge them and the individuals around them need to acknowledge them to be able to, you know, move forward and to overcome those, you know, very large inequalities that we do have in society. Right, right. So sort of moving on now, like you're a best-selling author and um, you've written a book called Good Crazy Advice, 10 Lessons Learned from 150 Leading Social Entrepreneurs. So could you tell me a little bit about the book, why you wrote it and how you went around about getting the content and then obviously getting it published? Right, right. So the so the book is actually Crazy Good Advice, 10 Lessons Learned from Oh, sorry. Yep. That's okay. That's okay. I, you know, I mispronounced somebody's name about three times in a podcast the other day before she finally corrected me halfway through. <laughs> like, oh, my goodness. Uh, but, yeah, so so um, here's, here's kind of the story of the book, the story of the book as opposed to what's in the book. So the story of the book is that, um, you know, like you, I'm a podcaster. Uh, I was out one night and exchanged business cards with somebody who introduced me to the president of a radio station who asked me to go on air and to produce a uh, weekly uh, radio program uh, during drive time. Uh, so wow. it, it was, yeah, it was really, it was quite an honor, except I had no idea <laughs> how to produce a radio program. So I knew I was going to have to hire some help in order to get this thing done. So that meant I needed to do a crowdfunding campaign, which I had never done, right? So I, I'm trying to launch a radio program, which I've never done. So I have to do a crowdfunding campaign, which I've never done. Uh, and I'm talking to Tom Dawkins. Tom Dawkins is out of Australia. He, uh, out, of, out of Australia, he uh, he runs an organization called Start Some Good. So if you think about Kickstarter or Indiegogo, they're sort of the you know the crowdfunding platform for people doing social good missions. And so I talked to him. I knew him, and I said, Tom, I'm going to do this crowdfunding campaign. You know, what's your best advice? And he walked me through some things. And one of the things he said was. You know, your friends are going to support you because they're your friends. That's what they do. But their friends are going to support you because there's something in it for them. What's what's a spiff or a something that they can benefit from supporting you? So we kicked around some ideas and he was saying it needs to be personal. It needs to be something that only you can provide. It needs to be something unique and all this. And so at the time, I was on episode 150 of my podcast, and at the end of every episode, I ask my guest um, for you know, their best piece of advice for a, an aspiring social entrepreneur. And I began to see a pattern. I began to see that they gave basically the same pieces of advice again and again. So I put it all into a spreadsheet and I put the advice in one column and in the next column, I put in, you know, sort of a category of that advice. And then I sorted the spreadsheet by the categories and it turns out there were really only 10 key pieces of advice that they were giving again and again. So I told this to Tom and I said, Tom, I've been trying to write a blog post about this, but it's sort of getting out of hand. And then sort of hesitantly, I said, maybe that could be a book. And Tom was like, yes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes, that's the thing, you know, that's the book. And so that's what we did. So, but here's the thing. In order to launch a radio program, which I'd never done, I had to do a crowdfunding, which I'd never done. So I had to write a book, which I had never done. And so um, I, instead of going to a traditional publisher, I thought of it as a spiff, as a giveaway, as something like that. So I decided to self-publish, but I hired an editor um, and then my wife is a graphic artist and a darn good editor too. And so she laid out the book and, and illustrated it. And I wrote the content and she edited it. And then the, we sent it all off to an editor who helped us to format it and shape it and really, you know, whip it into shape. Um, and then we gave it away 
during the crowdfunding campaign. You know, it's like give this amount of money and you get, you know, a paperback plus a digital plus whatever else you might get. And um, so we gave that away. And at the end of the crowdfunding campaign, we had a book. And so the book is based on these 10 key pieces of advice. And so we put it up on Amazon and it became a bestseller. And wow. that was that was shocking to me. Like, uh, you know, first it surprised me. You don't have to sell that many books to be a best-selling author. You know? <laughs> I mean, ten thousand books and you're a best-selling author, and everybody thinks you're something, right? But um, but we put it up on Amazon. It became bestseller, and then that, <coughs> excuse me, and then that opened up. Um, you know, speaking engagements and other opportunities and, you know, and, and and then it also is sort of in a circular way, it drove traffic back to the uh, to the podcast. And today we are in the top 1% of all downloaded podcasts in the world. So it's, you know, it's like this virtuous circle of things that happened because I said, yes, that's mm -hmm. it. Yeah, your podcast is is um, really really popular. I think it's you know been downloaded in 180 countries and half a million downloads, and you know just growing exponentially. So, right. I I think obviously the topic that you talk about social entrepreneurship and you know I suppose being better citizens is something that people really really aspire to. Right. And what I found really interesting about your book is that you had spoken to so many different people. And there was only really those 10 key themes that came out of it. So right. when people think that, that it's so hard to change and it's so hard to do better and it's, you know, so hard to progress, when you're breaking it down and it's really just 10 things, it's really not that hard to, to <laughs> sort of be a better person overall, right. you know, right. to be able to grow. Right. So I, I found that quite, uh, quite interesting. Thank you. But... I think every, everybody should read this book definitely for themselves. So I don't want to sort of, you know, do any spoilers or anything like that. But I just wanted to briefly chat on just two concepts or lessons within the book. And, right. and the first one is purpose drives passion. Right. Now, you know, we spoke a little bit earlier about, you know, finding your purpose, finding your why. Yeah. But how can people start that journey? Right. Well, I think the thing I said earlier is think about um, what breaks your heart. And and that's often what happens. Right. So, um, you know, one of the people I talked to, Liz Forkin Bohannon, she was you know, she was in university and she cared about women's issues and she was writing about women's issues and she was studying about women's issues. And then she um, she left her you know, university about the time of an economic downturn when it was really hard to find a job. And she found a corporate role and she's in her cubicle and she's thinking about the unfairness, how it's not fair that we have women's issues in the United States that are, you know, very challenging and women's issues in Australia that are very challenging. But then you go to Uganda and the issues that they're facing there. It's like, you know, in inequity in the largest you know, way possible. Mm -hmm. You're just so in, unequal in those societies. And she knew that uh, boys and girls came up through high school and then they were supposed to earn money to go to college during the summer. But it ended up that the all the jobs went to the boys, which meant all the college went to the boys. And so there was this unfair disadvantage to women in Uganda. And she's reading about this in her cubicle in her first week of her job, you know, just sitting here. And she's like, I just can't do this. So she bought a one way ticket to Uganda. Wow. So sometimes you just have to burn the ships, right? You have to just say, I'm all in. And when she went to Uganda, like she's, she met these young women and she, you know, met in villages and talked to elders and she really got to know their stories and understand what was going on. But then she just started experimenting. Like, what, what can I do? What do I have in my hand? What are my unique skills? What are the things that they need? What fits in this context in this marketplace? At one point, she even started a chicken farm. And like a month into it, she's like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <She can farm. laughs> so she like sort of control alt delete. She got rid of that. No more chicken farm. Uh, but eventually Liz Forkin Bohannon, she, she remembered that in college, she, she wasn't a fashion diva by any sense of the imagination, but she uh, remembered that she had 
made this set of sandals that where she had just took some old sandals and she put some ribbon through them and sort of laced them up her leg. And all through college, people would go, where did you get those sandals? And she's like, I, I don't know, just leave me alone. I just don't want them to flop, right? So <laughs> that was it. Um, but she uh, she remembered them and she sat down under, under a tree with three young women and made a big tub full of um, of sandals. And then she got on an airplane and she flew home and she sold them to her friends. She would do a trunk show where she would just sit in somebody's living room and say, here are the sandals and these are cool and here's how you lace them up. But let me tell you about the women who make them. And if we can help them to make some money, they're going to go to university. So today, Liz runs Seiko Design and they are a, you know, a, a large multinational organization that, you know, they're fashion leaders. Uh, Liz would have laughed in your face in the early days if you would have said she would have been a fashion leader. Uh, but she's cool and funky and fashionable in her own way. And she she empowers all these women by what she sells and how she sells it. And so, you know, that's an example of somebody who just let something break her heart she just decided to take some action. It's important to remember she didn't just go, you know, launch in the middle and say, I have an, an idea for an innovation. I'm just going to go start selling this stuff or making this stuff. She went and sat with the problem and she mm -hmm. listened and she did the empathy work where she really understood what the context was, what the cultural context was, what the challenges were, who the players were, how it needed to change, how she needed to shift it, excuse me, how she needed to shift it. And, um, and so that's an example of somebody who just let the world break her heart and then took action. That's absolutely amazing. And I think that's one of the things that I really like about your podcast is because the stories that people tell give everybody else that little bit of something that they can then take and go, right, well, what can I do? You know, how, and how can I do it? Because it's one thing to, you know, to understand what breaks your heart. It's another thing to be able to put that into to plans and to be able to do something about that, which yep. sort of leads me into the second thing that I wanted to sort of talk to you about um, from your book, which was, persist and pivot mm -hmm. so obviously she pivoted you know she was doing something completely different pivoted and and, and now is you know over in uganda and doing wonderful things right. so how important is it to be able to pivot and i think obviously COVID has, has taught us that a lot of people have had to do it right. but how important is it and what do you think the difference between i suppose persistence and pivoting is and is there is there a point where persistence becomes just annoying right right well the answer is yes right <laughs> uh yes to all of it so yeah, here's a few things one thing i just want to make sure i define a term so when we talk about pivoting we often think you know i'm going to go over here and i'm going to um i don't know i'm going to start a company that um, manufactures um, you know, some kind of product out of recycled plastic. And I'm just gonna go do that thing. And then we picture a pivot as now we're an information company and we sell Bitcoin, right? So that's not a pivot. That is just a you know, completely turning yourself inside out and reinventing yourself. And there's so many steps in between. But if you think about a pivot, if you're playing basketball and somebody throws you the ball you, you have to keep one foot planted on the floor while you're pivoting around. And so keeping yourself grounded as you pivot, I think that's an important concept. And we sometimes miss that in that word pivot. Um, but there, are, um, here's, here's the thing. The, the earlier you are in a company, the more loosely you should hold your idea. You know, to not let it be too precious. You know, even I right now, you know, I am five plus years out of my corporate career now, six plus years out of my corporate career. And I continuously pivot just ever so slightly on the things that I'm doing and what I'm offering. Um, it's very funny. I went back and looked at my uh, website. I first registered my domain of cultureshift.com. I registered that in 1997. 
And I was thinking earlier today about how many iterations of that were there and how many ways did it look? And there's a thing called the Wayback Machine. Mm -hmm. And you can go and look at your website at different times in history. And it's like, this is mind blowing, you know, how different everything is today and what I'm doing today and how I think about it all today. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's rare that you go from, you know, industry A and, um, you know, uh, organization A and function A, and suddenly you're completely in this new thing. So it is important to think about, am I still making progress? Um, and if I hold my idea loosely, then if somebody gives me feedback or the market gives me feedback. If the market says, we're not going to buy that, or you're charging too much, or, you know, um, it, I would buy it if it came in blue or something, you know, it's important to figure out, first of all, is that clear feedback? Is that really what the market is saying? Or is that just somebody saying something to say, I don't want to buy your stuff, right? Um, but it's important to just listen and, and to reduce risk. The way that you do that is you do experiments where you discover right? So back to Liz Fork and Bohannon, you know, she sat in the villages, she talked to the chief, she talked to the women, she talked to the young men, she did this discovery stuff. And then her first experiment where she made these sandals under a tree with three women and put them in a Tupperware tub and flew back to the United States to see if she could sell them. That was more, you know, so there's the discovery phase, but then there is this, you know, uh, am I really onto something? And so let's just validate. And so you go from discovery to validation. And once people are willing to reach in their pocket and hand you money for something, you're onto something. And now the only question is, will they pay more for it? Can I sell more of them? What does it cost me to acquire these customers? And now you're, you know, like now you have your feet under you. But the, the less you hang on precious to your company and your idea and your innovation and your impact or whatever that might be, the more you just sort of hold that as not precious, it's just an idea right now, uh, and then get feedback and then continuously improve and innovate and, and move your way out. You know, there's, a, there's this huge gulf between an idea and innovation and the impact. And really, you know, you need a, a blueprint to build a bridge to go from the idea to the innovation, a blueprint to build a bridge to go from the innovation to the impact. And so there's lots and lots of models out there. You know, you, you mentioned, you know, you hear the same advice again and again. Um, I think that we're all playing a remix tape, right? We're all just playing a mixtape where we, we're taking ideas from the marketplace from all over the place and, uh, and just mixing them together and showing them to other people and figuring out our our unique selling proposition to those. Well, Tony, you've certainly, you know, spent your life improving, innovating and absolutely making an impact. But I have one final question for you today. And that is, what would you do differently if only you knew? Hmm. If only you knew, what would you different, do differently? You know, um, today... I understand how human-centric design works. There's a, an organization called IDEO, and they sort of pioneered this work. Uh, but it's really at putting the person, putting the community, putting who you serve at the center of it all, and then building everything from there back. That was an idea I didn't know for a long time. You know, I understood market research in a very clinical kind of way. My degree was in marketing. I understood how to do market research, but I didn't really understand the importance of deep empathy and just sitting with people and getting to their problems and understanding where they're at. And I think if I understood that earlier, I could have made a lot more progress a lot faster and a lot sooner, and I could have had a greater impact in my life. So that, that would be the primary thing is just understanding human centric design, but especially that empathy work. I think that's, that's critical. That's excellent. And I think, you know, the more people that can show empathy the earlier on in life, um, you know, hopefully we can start to end sort of some of the inequality and, you know, the, the terrible things that sort of go on in the world. But you absolutely have um, empathy and um, making a huge impact, Tony. And I thank you so much for joining me today. And if you'd like to know more about Tony, I will have links to all of his socials, his website, his book, everything about Tony on my website, if only in you podcast.com.au. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Christy.